So the Lambda Red system uh, had been used for um, recombineering, as it was called, for a long time, particularly with these double-stranded DNA cassettes. And uh, around 2009, there was a report um, from George Church's lab at Harvard um, that you could uh, use synthetic DNA in the form of short oligonucleotides. Um, and this was at an era in biotechnology where short oligonucleotides, short meaning it works well if there are about 90 base pairs, but you could potentially do with as short as 60. Um, you know, these are, these are DNA sequences that you could get for maybe $20 um, and you could get them in, in two or three days. Um, and so you could also get thousands of these um, targeting different regions of the genome. And you could just have a population of cells that grow to a certain density that you would want to do electroporation, um, you know, overexpress your lambda uh, red uh, recombinase machinery, uh, electroporate with your, your oligonucleotides. And so your oligos are um, already single-stranded. Uh, there's really no role for exo um, in that case, but the lambda beta protein um, will be able to, you know, facilitate that single-strand annealing um, process. And then you can just, based on the very short regions of homology that you've given your oligos, um, you can get uh, mutations. Um, throughout the genome. And then you can actually just keep doing this and, and cycling it as is, is kind of shown in both of these um, illustrations to varying details. You know, you can grow your cells, um, induce the, the beta protein, um, do your electroporation and recover, and then just immediately um, do your next round uh, of um, transformation. So this was a highly accelerated way to do genome engineering, uh, and also a very um, efficient way to generate combinations. Because when you think about some of these alternatives, um, for example, both of these methods here involve a step one and step two, and they involve targeting and uh, the use of a selectable marker for only one particular region at a time, thus uh, not allowing you to do this combinatorially. Um, whereas here, one advantage is that you can, you know, introduce as many oligos into the population as you want. Um, right before I left the church lab, we um, were doing a, an experiment where we were using 15 oligos, for example. Um, only took us less than a week to get all 15 mutations into the genome, um, which is pretty fast. Um, and uh, the problem is, typically, uh, that you don't have a selection here. So you need to be able to um, actually get good efficiency of your mutation uh, of, of these um, oligos um, for a, a reasonably high, what's called allylic replacement um, frequency. Um, so this concept was new in E. coli, but it uh, had been, you know, some of the, the origins of it stem uh, from as early as 1988, where it was noted that you could use single-stranded DNA oligos in yeast. Um, S. cerevisiae actually has a really efficient homologous recombination system naturally, so you don't need any kind of phage proteins. Uh, and so in this paper um, from 1988, uh, you see the use of, um, you know, <laughs> oligonucleotides as short as 20 nucleotides. Um, and okay, 20 is, is awfully small. Um, who knows if you're getting good targeting in that case. Um, but yeast is, is hyper effective at homologous recombination. And so there are some plots here, um, at least one of which shows some kind of a trade-off um, emerging, much like we had discussed. Uh, in the length of the oligo, this one centered seemingly closer to, to 50 being ideal, um, probably because at longer lengths, you might have more trouble with transformation. It's unclear. You can also see the, the, the relationship between the amount of oligonucleotides. Uh, you might need a, a high quantity, relatively speaking, in order to get this to work. 
Um, so there were, there were many, um, you know, uh, many previous innovations that hinted towards the possibility of being able to do multiplex genome engineering using oligos. Um, and if we go back to the publication of MAGE, as it's called, um, you can see some interesting relationships here that um, affect your all allylic replacement efficiency. Um, and so uh, what's, what's often shown on the x-axis here is size and base pairs of, of your oligo or your cassette in this case. And I mean, part of the distinction between those terms is that a cassette is usually double-stranded um, an oligo is always single-stranded, uh, and um, you can't really generate oligos above uh, about 100 base pairs or so. Um, and so on the y-axis is plotted your, uh, your replacement efficiency, and if you notice, this method is, um, you know, we didn't talk about what the Cas9 cutting efficiency is. In a lot of systems, it's usually one or two percent of your cells get a cut. So when you think about that, you, you recognize immediately that you need some way of finding out which one or two percent got your cut, because that's a really small percentage. Um, and then when you use a um, antibiotic base, antibiotic resistance based selection um, with recombinering, um, you know, if you're doing it well, sometimes 100% of the colonies just on your plate have that exchange. Um, of course, that's, that's already coming after some kind of selection. But um, I think that the point here is that um, what your efficiency numbers are dictate um, more or less the need uh, for a selection. And when you're operating in this 10 to 20% range, if you're talking about making changes to DNA on the genome, you can use PCR techniques to tell you if you've made those changes. Um, and if you've got about one in 10 that you might have changed, that's okay. That's about on the threshold of tolerable in terms of it's not too hard to do PCR on 10 colonies and find out which one made the change, which one received the change. Um, if your efficiency is, you know, getting closer to 50%, you you can almost start to do mul many more multiplexed at once, do your, your sort of checks later, and then see what you got. If you're down in the below 5% range, you are in a more difficult situation. You really want to couple this to, to something where you have an ability to enrich or select. And you can see then why these trends are all important. If you're trying to do a mismatch, uh, if that's a change you're trying to make in the genome, well, if you have mismatches that exceed, um, you know, 10 base pairs, even five or six, you start to see a pretty steep drop off in what kind of replacement efficiency you can get. Um, similarly, if you're trying to insert bases, um, you know, maybe you're trying to insert or append a particular um, degradation tag or his tag for purification um, to your to your gene uh, ultimately to your protein uh, you can see how the the efficiency drops uh, we've talked a lot about deletions and their role in in um, in metabolic engineering and you can see on uh, this now your your x and y axes are on log scale here and so you can clearly see how much um, your, your deletion strategy um, uh, can affect replacement efficiency. But uh, one of the clever ways that people got around this is by rather than trying to just delete and remove a big chunk of DNA, um, you could introduce instead a premature stop codon. Um, and what that would effectively do is the ribosome then would get to a certain point, usually very early on in your protein sequence, and just end terminate translation, and so you've effectively deleted your protein. Um, some downsides to that are, is if your um, small peptide that you end up making, because you are going to make something, is um, problematic in some way, toxic, 
prone to aggregation, misfolding, which actually you know, seems pretty reasonable if you've arbitrarily cut off a protein and you just have, say, a ton of some loop region um, building up in the cell, that, that could be a problem. Um, something else that could be a problem is if you had a, a, a ribosome binding site, a weak one, say, downstream of where you introduced your premature stop codon, you might still get a protein that's made uh, downstream of that that might, in some cases, still be functional. So you have to be a little careful with that strategy. But it is a way to get around this problem because then you've effectively changed something from being what is still a functional deletion or an inactivation, more precisely, um, from being a deletion category to a mismatch. And uh, something that I'll just con conclude on on the slide is that, you know, you can sort of predict uh, uh, how this replacement efficiency uh, percentage might look like based also on the hybridization um, energy uh, between the oligo and the targeted complement region in the genome. Um, so you see a, a pretty reasonable prediction there. 